So what exactly is performance art? Well, performance art is an interdisciplinary style of art whereby um, an event or performance is presented in a manner that's indicative of an exhibit. Um, the work may be scripted or spontaneous. It could be um, live or recorded and the artist and the audience can both either be fully absent or fully present. Um, performance art uh, expands this notion of art and it challenges the idea of performance as something that is done by a performer specifically for an audience. When actuality, um, one of the key elements of performance art is that it actually um, can be done by either the artist and the spectators as well. So there are four basic elements of importance when considering a performance art piece. Time, space, the performer's influence on the work, and um, this relationship between the uh, performer and or the spectator. Um, performance art isn't really limited to time and space. It can actually be done in any setting, at any time, for any duration of time. Um, and this dynamic between the artist and the spectator, as well as um, the experience from both spectrums, this is what ultimately constructs the art piece. Uh, you know, the great thing about performance art is that um, it can be seen or taken in so many different ways by every individual who experiences it. But ultimately, you know, the most um, significant element of performance art is that it must have many layers of meaning to it. And um, I think that's one of the, the main reasons why I decided to use Marina Abramovich and specifically the artist is present because I find that her work tends to have many layers of meaning and um, it's work that's, you know, rather deep. Marina Abramovich, who has been active for over three decades and is known as the grandmother of performance art, started her career as an artist at the Academy of Fine Arts in Belgrade, Serbia, from 1965 to 1970. She went on to complete her postgraduate studies at the Academy of Fine Arts in Croatia in 1972. In the years to follow, she performed multiple pieces in Yugoslavia in the mid-1970s a time period in which working with performance as an art did not exist. While there, her performance pieces, which were often eccentric and controversial, addressed Yugoslavian issues such as communism and the social and family structure. Later on, when she moved to the West, she then had to develop new practice and a new way of working that used more universal parameters. After moving to Amsterdam in the late 1970s, Abramovich met the German performance artist Uwe Leschipen, who was better known as Ule. The duo went on to have multiple collaborations that focused mostly on the ego and artistic identity. They began to create an inseparable relationship of complete trust and referred to themselves as part of a two-headed body. Abramovich and Yule both explored extreme states of consciousness and their relationship to architectural space, devising many works in which their bodies created spaces for audience interaction. After a decade-long relationship and years of tense relations, Abramovich and Yule decided to end their relationship in 1988. They did this through a spiritual journey in which they each walked the Great Wall of China, starting from two opposite ends and meeting in the middle to say goodbye. We very soon we become this great art couple when everybody was projecting like a perfect image. In reality, he was not happy with this position. And somehow, the more better pieces we've been doing in the performance, the worse our relation will get in, in private. 
And later on, it's like his interest was different than my interest, and he was really kind of experiencing life, go for drinking, go for the drugs. And then he become unfaithful, which was very hard for me. We were monogamous till a certain point when the tightness of that ideology started to unravel, started to disintegrate a little bit. Then she had at the same time a sexual adventure with somebody like I had, the same time. Except she did it with a friend of ours, I didn't. Wow, shouldn't have said that. It took us about eight years of negotiations to get permission to walk the Chinese wall. And during the negotiation, many times he had to take a trip to China, and she was a translator. And when we finished Chinese wall, he told me that uh, she was pregnant. And he asked me what I should do. I said, what you should do? <laughs> you know, I leave and you do whatever you want. So they married. It is like, you know, like it began. It ended like it began. It began like this, and it ended like this. That's all. Abramovich took a break from art for quite some time until 2005, when she performed a recreation piece at the Gungheim Museum in New York City. Titled Seven Easy Pieces, Abramovich recreated the work of five performance artists from the 1960s to the 1970s for seven consecutive nights. The pieces were arduous, requiring both physical and mental concentration. In the years to follow, Marina spent time training for what would be her longest piece yet. The artist is present. This too required practice, patience, and extreme physical training. Abramovich says that she continues to create performances that have a longer duration because she wishes to spend her time doing nothing else but the art that she enjoys. She feels as though she's running out of time the older she ages. Therefore, she uses the time that she does not have in life and spends it on her work. Her work continues to explore the relationship between the performer and the audience, the limits of the body, and the possibilities of the mind. Abramovich is attracted to the concept of performance because it can offer a more compelling experience than photo documentation, props, or sculpture. She believes that performance has the power to change not only the life of the performer, but also those witnessing the performance. In beginning this piece, Abramovich sought different ways that she could use her body and push it to the limit. She strives for long durational work because she believes that performances that last a short time leave the window open for acting or pretend. However, in doing something for a long period of time, as she did for three months, with the artist is present, it ultimately became a way of life, a real, all-encompassing experience. Abramovich set out to break the idea that the public is perceived only as a group and not as individuals. Through this work, she gave the public, her audience, the opportunity to have a one-to-one -one experience with an artist, which she believes distinguishes this work from any of her other pieces. In giving every individual her full and undivided attention, she was able to explore the oneness of people's character. The artist is present was one of Abramovich's many captivating performance pieces, where she placed herself at the center of her own exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. 
For three months, Abramovich sat silently fixed in the museum's atrium and allowed the viewers to take turns sitting opposite of her, staring at each other for however long the visitor could endure. During the performance, Marina did not flinch. She did not smile. Even unplanned interruptions by other artists did not break her. For this piece, the audience was present and the situation was extremely simple. In the first two months, the setup consisted of a wooden table and two chairs. In the last month, the table was removed, leaving just the two chairs. The table was removed because she felt that she did not need the obstacle that took away from the experience. She realized that in the middle of looking at the individual, she only saw the eyes and therefore the structure of the table was no longer required. After removing it, she says, the strangest thing was that I still saw it like a gray shadow. It was as though I was going crazy, but I realized that when you are in a stillness, an entire parallel world opens up to you, which is normally invisible, because we're always moving. When you get into this stillness, you start feeling things you could never imagine feeling normally. And the public started feeling what I was feeling. Why was it so emotional? I can't explain it to you. You just have to experience it. During the piece, Abramovich wore three different colors, all having to do with energy. The blue dress served as a calming force in the first month, in which she needed to relax and initiate herself into the role. By the middle of the piece, her energy level was incredibly low, and red served as the energy source to replenish her stamina. She ended her performance with white, which symbolized the purity she felt in completing the piece. Aside from the spectacle of this being the largest performance exhibition ever presented by the Museum of Modern Art, complete with large crowds themselves performing in front of and between the works, the exhibit circled around two core concepts, one aesthetic and one conceptual performance and exhaustion. In any kind of artwork, there's an enormous amount of preparation to produce results that look effortless. Many would argue that Abramovich's performance was quite simple. However, there's nothing easy about sitting motionless for that length of time. Merely sitting motionless for three hours will cause complications one would never anticipate. After an hour and a half, muscles begin to tense up and there may be a loss of consciousness. But at the elderly age of 62, Abramovich pushed herself to the limit in this 737 hour piece that required an enormous amount of willpower. Abramovich says, when the body understands that you're not going to move, the pain disappears, and you really start having an out-of-body experience, which sounds mystical, but it's true. You leave the body, but then the pain returns again, and you just have to keep going. Abramovich trained two years for this piece, both physically and mentally. Physical stamina is not the only strategy for the foundation of this work, as determination and willpower are both essential factors. The mind appears to be the biggest obstacle in a work that requires this much stamina. The idea of this piece was to be absolutely present in the moment. The mind cannot wander anywhere else. She did not limit time when spectators sat opposite her, and it was amazing what happened to people. They became anxious or angry because they had to wait for a long time, or they would become suspicious, 
timid, or self-conscious. Then, after six to seven minutes, they would enter this zone where sound disappears and Marina disappears. They become the mirrors of themselves. Incredible emotions surfaced, and many people often cried. The idea behind my work, President Rutgers Newark, centered on the basis of Abramovich's exhibit. This performance served as an experimental reinterpretation of her work, though the length of time and the level of exhaustion don't nearly compare. After about a semester's worth of physical and mental preparation, I spent two hours a day for one full week at the end of March in sitting completely motionless in the Paul Robinson Campus Center Art Gallery. Students, staff, Faculty, all members of the Rutgers community were encouraged to come see the exhibit and sit opposite of me in an attempt to build some type of connection through nothing else but close proximity, direct eye contact, and complete silence. The entire length of this performance was recorded. Before I could hold this live event, I needed to train myself and build the physical stamina that I needed for a live performance of this magnitude. So this was actually my first time sitting in front of anyone um, in complete silence. And um, as you can see, we're both not really used to the situation at all. It was actually quite some time that we had to do this. We sat in front of each other for about 20 minutes. And um, at first it was a matter of getting past the little giggles because of the awkwardness of the situation and just how uncomfortable we both were. Um, but then after that, even still, you can tell that we were both beginners, especially myself, because, you know, there was a lack of focus. I couldn't sit still. I couldn't really, um, attain the level of focus that I needed for a performance of this magnitude. Um, eye contact was not really there, um... I think because I knew that she was uncomfortable, it made me uncomfortable, and for that reason I got a little worried and I didn't want to constantly be staring at her because I didn't want to make her feel any more uncomfortable than she already was. Um, I was constantly moving, as you can see, um, and you know, being that it was the very first time I'd ever attempted this, um, I'd say it wasn't as bad, but from this footage, you can clearly tell that there obviously needs to be, you know, a lot more work done to reach the level of focus that I would need for uh, my live performance.
So OJ was the second person that I sat with, and it turned out that OJ would eventually be one of the most important assets in training me for this project. OJ was really great, and he was really helpful in training me because it's evident in these videos that him and I were both on very different levels in terms of our focus. Um, OJ was able to make direct eye contact, and he was really serious the entire way through. He had an all-encompassing idea of what it meant to be a part of this piece in terms of the way that he was just very much in the zone. And the difference between him and I was that I moved way too much. You know, I was constantly doing something and I wasn't really attaining the focus that I needed to be able to perform this event. I was constantly flipping my hair, I was constantly playing with my eyelashes. I continued to move and um, I really couldn't make eye contact with him and I think that a big part of that was just the fact that he did not take his eyes off me, not even for a moment. I felt often times that he was staring me down and it was almost as if he was piercing right through me. You know, as if I was completely unclothed and he can see everything right down to my core. And I realized after shooting a lot of these practice videos, that was the level of focus that I needed to attain. And so the reason why OJ ended up being such a huge and important asset in preparing me for this live performance was that he had the focus that I needed to attain in order to be on that mental state of full and utter preparation. And so over the course of the semester, OJ continued to sit with me and train me. And unfortunately, those videos were not documented, but I really believe that his focus and my willingness to want to be on his level are essentially what led me in the right direction when it came time to do the live performance. So this was my time with Benny, and this time around it only lasted for about 10 minutes. One thing that I did notice was that I haven't had much improvement in terms of the focus that I needed for this performance. I was still doing the same things that I had done in the previous trials, fidgeting, lack of focus, lack of eye contact, playing with hair, playing with eyelashes, looking away when the other person focused on me for too long. Just a list of things that I really needed to avoid doing if I wanted my performance to be a success. And if I really wanted to delve deep into the core of the reason or the purpose behind this project, which is to maintain eye focus, maintain mm -hmm. eye contact, maintain my composure and lie motionless in order for me to really discover diversity or discover the oneness of people. And so I really didn't have the greatest training team in terms of people who could really prepare me for this performance. And that's evident here as you can tell because for the most part, when we would look at each other, we would laugh. And that's something I really wanted to avoid doing, especially when it came time for the live performance. And so I can really tell here that I wasn't too prepared for this event. And I think that Benny would probably agree with me. Word moments in silence, not too strong suit.
On the opening day of my performance, I definitely got a much better outcome than I had anticipated. I wasn't expecting too many participants. However, there was rarely a moment when the seat opposite of me was empty. I felt like the performance went by fairly smooth, and it actually flew by very quickly. I was so focused on those in front of me that time did not seem of the essence. I was amazed at how much I had improved over the course of my training and how in the zone I was. I'm slightly overwhelmed by how I already feel, especially since it was the first day. Most of the participants that began the show with me were people I knew. However, spending the time engaging with them on such an intimate level introduced me to new findings about people that I thought I had known so well, given that I had spent the last four years with them. One of my friends admitted to me after the performance how difficult it was for him to stay as focused as he did. I could tell during the silence that it was quite difficult for him because I saw him struggling to keep his focus on me. I think he got a little distracted from time to time. He told me how he wasn't expecting to be so terrible in maintaining eye contact and how he felt this is a huge obstacle for him. He told me it was like I was piercing his body and looking right through him, which made him slightly uncomfortable. He asked me how he could become someone who could maintain good eye contact because he thinks it's an admirable trait, one that he will need in his future career. I simply told him to watch the artist as present. We both laughed about it, but I never knew in all the time that I've known him that this was such a large issue for him. You can't have a performance without skeptics. So of course we had people who were very doubtful of the performance. As much as I tried to tune everyone out, the gallery door was open and I could hear people outside saying, oh, this isn't art. What I found very interesting was that it was those people who actually came and sat down in front of me. I guess they wanted to see for themselves what all the fuss was about. One of them was my sister. We don't spend much time together, so I thought it was interesting that we took the time to focus in on each other for a period of time. After the performance, my friends told me that she appeared to have a softer look on her face, and that I appeared stern and serious. I guess that describes our relationship in a nutshell. It was weird because everyone that knows us knows that we are complete and utter opposites. And outside of this performance, I would agree with this. But during these few moments, for me, it felt like I was looking right at my mirror. I think that having my friends present at the beginning of the performance paved the way for other people who I didn't know to participate which was really great. I thought that it was really interesting how those that sat for the longest period of time were in fact people that I didn't previously know. A few had to let out an initial giggle, but once they began feeling more comfortable with me, I think they really let their walls down and allowed for a connection to take place. I can't accurately say or describe into words the connection that was made but it was definitely an experience that I don't think I could have gotten from any other performance art piece. I think that when you really take the time to place your entire focus on another individual, you can, in fact, connect on a level that doesn't require words. Something that I have always been told, but never experienced for myself, was that you can learn a lot about an individual by looking into their eyes. Now imagine doing this for five to 10 minutes. I didn't realize how true the statement was until during my performance. I could see joy in people's eyes, sadness, fear, confusion, intimidation, 
boredom and curiosity. And I saw all these traits in at least one person that I spent time with on my first day. Like I said, I was really overwhelmed by what I discovered in the first day alone, and I wasn't expecting to have this feeling of excitement at the end of the day. The second day of my performance went just as well as the previous day, and I was very pleased with the outcome. I felt a lot more comfortable at the beginning of this performance because of the previous day's success. I started the performance off with someone I knew, which I was really happy about because it got me comfortable enough to be able to sit with strangers. It went well, and I was actually pleased with those that I knew. You see, the fact that I knew them prior to this performance, and I was well aware of how immature they could be, initially made me feel like this was going to be a disastrous case the moment they sat down. However, I was so amazed and how much they took it seriously. They were, just as I was, fully present. And this really made me happy. It was also great that I felt that I was able to connect with some of these people on a much deeper level than previously. Because in a normal setting, there is constant talking and lack of eye contact. However, when you take the time to sit in front of those that you previously knew, you're amazed at the connection that can result. During the performance, one young woman did something that really made me feel she was fully present with me in the moment. We started our session off just fine, and I thought that she was fully focused. But I didn't realize that she could attain a much deeper level of presence until she decided to remove her glasses halfway through. It was during that moment where I recognized just how present she fully was. And that was the moment when I felt that our connection was at its deepest. My advisor came and participated in the event. I had done a practice session with him previously but this time, we were both a lot more zoned in and fully present. I know he is very familiar with Abramovich's work, and he was the one who helped me coordinate this entire event. But I really felt like when he sat down across from me, he felt the difficulty of my task. Immobile, silent, and fixed. I knew then that he really appreciated my dedication to this piece, and I felt that just by looking into his eyes. This is the connection I believe was established. I had a young gentleman who came and sat down before me and was so unbelievably focused and zoned in, I almost felt that he was piercing right through me. And I hadn't felt like this all performance long from anyone else. I thought more than anything that he would have a greater impact on me than I did on him. However, it caught me completely off guard when he began to cry and respectfully got up. 
What surprised me even more was that he came back for a second round. The second time around was much longer, and we were both so fully present. I'm not sure I know how to express that into words. My eyes were fixed on him, and I saw nothing else in the room, not even the wall behind him. I felt the deepest connection with him, but I'm not sure why. Once again, he began to cry and got up. I knew at that moment that if all else failed during my performance for the remainder of the week, this one specific session with this one young man made the entire journey worth it. I had the opportunity during my performance to sit across one of my very best friends. I think that it was a really interesting experience, but I don't think I got much out of it. It was really hard to take the situation serious, and we both kept going in and out of smiles. You see, the problem with sitting motionless and in complete silence across someone you already know so well is that it doesn't give you the opportunity to focus in on the way you would like. I would have imagined that forming a connection during the performance would be easy with someone you already know inside and out. But for some reason, it was more difficult for me to do this with her than it was with complete strangers. Thankfully, our connection outside of this performance is already built on an incredibly solid foundation. So the result of time that we spent in silence does not worry me. Two young men waited until the very end of the performance because they wanted to speak to me. They wanted to know what I saw in them. I think a really big misconception about this performance from those who come and sit across of me is that I'm supposed to find something in each individual and be able to tell them what I saw in them. But this isn't always the case. The idea behind this event is to be able to see if you can form a connection with an individual, a way to find the uniqueness and character of each person. I believe I formed many connections, but this doesn't necessarily mean that I can read them. I'm not psychic. The only thing I was able to offer these individuals is my personal experience, which is that I believe that connections were formed. I was able to grow a deep level of compassion some of these individuals, people I have never even met before or spoken to. It was something quite unique. What are the They want to know what you, how... I mean, what did you find? It was like... It's not something you can put into words. When they say that you... On the third day of my performance, I had a visit from OJ, who was one of my friends that had previously practiced this piece with me and helped me train. He was great as always. The very first time we practiced, I felt like I could not stay still and I was constantly moving, fidgeting, and had a lack of focus. I felt I had improved over the course of this journey and I know during the performance, OJ felt it too. The very first time, I felt so uncomfortable with OJ because I felt like his focus was too intense and that he was looking right through me 
as if I was completely unclothed. It was like he was stripping away at my exterior. During the performance, I felt like he had that exact same fire. However, I had it too. I really felt like the intensity during the performance with OJ was incredibly strong. It was like there was a fire in between us and our two flames were battling each other, but nobody else could see it or feel it. It was part of the unique connection we built during our silence. I've grown close to OJ and I found a great friendship in him throughout this journey. So it was really great that I felt it too during our last performance together. During the performance, another one of my best friends visited me. It was a complete disaster. I guess I should have learned from the previous attempt that there isn't much success in this piece when I attempt it with one of my friends. The entire time for the past two days, I couldn't be cracked. But this ball of joy and laughter came in and brought out the lightheartedness in me. The moment she laughed, my focus escaped and I could not stop laughing. I was a little disappointed in myself, but at the same time, I'm human. I'm not a professional. To be honest, it was well worth it. She brought out the playfulness in me and I'm thankful for that, even if it wasn't along the guidelines of my performance. The final guest was informed by a friend who had done it the day before, so she really wanted to be a part of this experience. I saw a great deal of compassion and joy, and she was really interested in the art piece. We talked after the performance, and she said she really loved what I was doing. As a psychology major, she told me that it had been scientifically proven that humans can connect without the use of words. I don't need science to tell me this. I already knew this from the journey alone. I spoke to her about how I was a science major and being this for the last four years, I was always under the impression that things were concrete, that everything was based off of facts and needed to be proven. But this performance taught me something that I hadn't learned the last four years. You don't need proof to feel that something is right. I felt connections with people. I can't prove that. I can only say that this is what I felt. Sometimes, things don't need a right answer. It's not possible to define this experience into words because it's something that can only be felt by the participants of this piece. It is, however, Inevitable that two people who lay silently fixed on each other for a great deal of time can establish a unique connection and come to identify each other as unique individuals, not just as numbers and an overly hyped statistic. The overwhelming epiphany I had was that I thought I could understand a person and all about them just because I stared at them for a great deal of time. However, Going through this experience, I learned that this is surely impossible. There's no way to learn something about someone just by staring at them for a period of time. Through this experience, I was able to find the oneness in each individual. Not because I had the power to read them, but because I discovered that no two people are the same, because no two connections are the same. I established many connections. Some that caused some people to cry or laugh. 
or make me laugh. But regardless of the situation, I felt connected. It is just difficult to express how far that connection goes. Sometimes, there doesn't need to be proof. There just needs to be an understanding that there is a gray area amidst the black and white. Things are not always concrete. I guess it's what I needed to learn about diversity when I took on this challenge. We are a diverse group of individuals, but not because we are black or white, because we are gray. Because there are many things that define us as a diverse humans beyond the color of our skin. Because there are other components, gray components, that aren't always concrete, right or wrong. And sometimes, we don't need to put this into words. We merely need to observe, be fully present in what is before us. And we can clearly see that we are gray not defined, but a combination of many things that makes us what we are. Rutgers Newark, the most diverse campus in the nation. Thank you.